This is Lady Champ, Chicago Champions Crew, and you're listening to my boy, Hard Roman. Nicely done. is WCGO Radio in Chicago, where Chicago goes for celebrity hotline conversations early on a Saturday morning. That is a re 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 remix of a song that initially came out in the mid-80s. That is Freestyle 2000 with Don't Stop the Rock. My name is Harv Roman. Every Saturday at about this time, we celebrate with words and music of people that you should know. And why am I playing B-boy music? B-girl music, music that came out initially in the mid-80s and was remixed for the next millennium, which is the version that you're hearing right now, because I've got somebody on the Celebrity Hotline who you really, really need to get to know. She is back from her Wings of Life um, adventure. It was a climb, it was a walk, it was a run, it was all kinds of things. And Lady Champ from Chicago itself, Logan Square, Humboldt Park, she's adopted by everyone, went out as a uh, fundraising and an awareness event for Wings of Life. She was able to do that. Go um, to Wings of Life, Google it, go to Lady Champ's Facebook, find out about it, because even though the event is now over, it was held on May the 4th, the cause continues. And as a result of that, we were finally able to track down Lady Champ, because she's from here, but she goes everywhere else. And we've talked for the last couple of years in terms of doing a Celebrity Hotline conversation, and it was has been done. And the timing is, is somewhat perfect if you think about it, because we wouldn't have been able to talk about Wings for Life at any other point in time except right now in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, following in the footsteps, or, or maybe walking alongside Chicago's very own Adolfo Chabadu Pinones and Anna Rockefeller Garcia from New York, we bring to you Lady Chamber, everybody. I'm on the celebrity hotline is somebody who I initially had talked to, what what is it then? I think two, two and a half years ago. Lady Champ, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Uh, um, I'm doing okay. We, we were talking off the air for a little while about, you know, our initial you know, uh, introduction and what we were going to talk about when we first met. And, and for some reason, my mind froze. You know why? Because it's supposed to be spring. It's like 20 degrees outside. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's what ended up um, freezing my mind. But um, refresh my memory as to, you know, our, our first meeting. Um, I believe we met at Columbia College. We were, me and Marco Fuller were showing the, uh, all the ladies say film, which she's the, she made the documentary. And um, one of the characters in the film, and then we had a panel discussion, and you were there, so she introduced me to you. But um, yeah, that's how we met, and that's where we were. 
I, re I remember that now. That was such a strong film. And the, and the weather, I remember that day, that day was lousy. Because, oh my God, yes. Because I have to take the bus and the train and I got to go downtown. But I knew that I needed to meet Anna or Rockefeller because we had interviewed and we had become friends. And I said, I got to go, I got to meet her. And then to meet you was a bonus because th there are not that many... Um, personalities in, in the dance community here in Chicago. I say in particular the breakdancing community. And when you're when you're talking about footsteps followed, you're talking about Adolfo Quinones, Shabadu, who's another friend of mine who went to the same grade school and boys and girls club that I went to. So you have followed in, I guess, the interview type of footsteps of Shabadu and, and Rockefeller. So so welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm so glad to be in her film. I'm so glad to even know her. She's an amazing, amazing girl. Well, the interesting thing was when you looked at that film back then, and, and maybe you could tell us if, if there's a way to either get a hold of the film or are, are there excerpts on YouTube, was, you know, when we were talking to, to Anna or Rockefeller, she talked about back then trying to fit in to a game that was played mostly by males. And, and through the miracle of the footwork that she put together, she became accepted and she became, you know, the, the queen of lady breakdancers in New York. And I would imagine that you have, you're a bit younger than us, but you probably have had some of the same obstacles. Well, yeah, um, uh, breaking is a male-dominated culture, so it's like, you know, it's it's hard for a girl to stand out, and it's, it's but it's easy when a girl's good. You know, when, when you start getting good, you start going to battles, you start calling, you know, the guys out, it gets a little easier and easier, and thank God for me, that's how it was. Now, how young or how old were you when you decided this is something that you wanted to do? I, I've, I've been doing Boys and Girls Club work for more than 30 years, and I and I remember when things were blowing up. Um, back then, Boogaloo Shrimp and, and Shabadoo went to Talcott School because that's where Shabadoo went to school. And then they, you know, we had kids from the Boys and Girls Club cross the street to go to Talcott, and they gave their big, they gave a big speech. And at the time, the first breaking movie was out. So you're talking about like 1983, 1984 ago, when you were probably maybe two feet high at, <laughs> at what point did you decide you know what I want I want to do what they're doing actually it was at that time because my cousins were uh, they were in the crew called um, uh, what is the crew oh my god I can't believe I forgot uh, I'll tell you the first dance group that I that I remember being showcased on Oprah Winfrey was the floor masters way back when oh no they're the planet rockers planet rockers there you go and I used to look up to them. I thought they were everything. And I would ask them to teach me, but they wouldn't because I'm the, I was a girl. They were like, get out of here. You're just a girl. And I was like, but I want to learn. I was little. And they're like, get out of here. You're a girl. And I was like, so I would just sit and watch. And then in the 90s, when I was 16, I saw my crew, who I ended up meeting and getting in the crew. They saw them. And I was like, this is it. This is it. I'm doing it now. And no one can tell me no. So that's how I got into it in the 90s. Now, now, back then, I remember we, I had a guy, uh, this kid named Luis Marino, um, they called him Cuito, and on the third floor of the club, he and uh, some, a few of the other kids, one of, my, one of them was my cousin Carlito, they used to break dance in the, in the hall. There was a big lobby on the third floor. And what I remember most about those days and the events that I used to host, as soon as somebody broke out into break dancing, there would be a huge crowd gathered around to watch whatever the steps were, whatever the moves were. And, and you know, I've, I've DJed and I've hosted events and stuff, but I've never been to the point where I'm smack dab in the middle of people looking at every single move I'm making. When you're in that environment and you just decide you want to spin around and, and do the footwork and whatnot, what is that feeling like to have so many people just looking at you and, and awestruck at what you're doing? Um, sometimes it feels a little scary, once you, but once you get in, you want to keep going back in because you feel your adrenaline running and you just feel like you're in a zone. You just, you honestly, when you, when you're in, in there, you don't even see all those people. You just want to show your skill. So once you're in, you're in, you're good. But before that, you do get a little, you know, the little butterflies maybe, or, you know, a little bit nervous, but once you're in, you're in, you're good. Now, how, how close was it to real life when you look at a movie, you know, like the original Breaking movie where Shabadoo and Boogaloo Shrimp are kind of the kings of the jungle and everybody kind of wants to knock them off so they do whatever they can in order to come up with whatever just to say that they beat Shabadoo. That, that I'm going to say, was more like 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, now every everything's a little friendlier, like, you know, everybody gets along more and 
if they don't compete the way we used to. Like, we would go to a battle geared up and ready to battle a crew, like call any crew out. Now it's like you go to a battle and you have to sign up to battle, you know, whoever signs up. It's, it's different now. But back then when, when I was breaking, yeah, it was like that. Now, it's interesting, too, because at one point, you know, I'm, I'm hosting events and we would do a lot of battle of the dance groups and battle of the DJs type stuff. And a lot of times I'm hosting events where I'm saying, you know what, if these kids were not here doing this, they'd be somewhere else getting into trouble. And for at least a few hours at Centrum Hall or Masters Hall or the Rainbow or whatever at the time, they were not getting in trouble. And, I, and sometimes I think that there's a lack of respect for the young people that are involved in that type of stuff because people will look at you, judge you, and decide you're making trouble because you're dancing. I agree 100%. And the sad thing is that they last year, and in the past few years, they closed already three community centers down. And these kids have nowhere to go practice, nowhere, you know, nothing to do. You know, and, and when you have nowhere to practice, you start getting into other things. And actually, breaking is really good. Before I used to break, I used to get into fights like crazy. And when I started breaking, I didn't care about anything but breaking. You know, and a lot of the breakers that I grew up with, and I know, they, they tell me the same thing. Oh, I was always in trouble. I was doing this. I was, you know, I was a game hanger. I was selling drugs. But as soon as they started dancing, they left that life. And they just, and they're still breaking too. You know, it's funny that you say that because I was with the Boys and Girls for more than 30 years, and, and then budget cuts happened, and, and I had to move on from the club. You're probably familiar with the club in Humboldt Park on, on Crystal and Washington. I, I was the director of that club for a few years. And, you know, it's interesting with the different styles that we have when we're working with our youth, but something as simple as changing leadership and changing strategies can affect young people. You've worked with young people as well, so tell me about some of, some of those adventures before we continue to talk about them. Because I, I, you know, I love the breakdance story and I like your personal stories, but I know that, that, that you are so in love with working with young people. Well, the thing is that I start off with the teaching, but you know, some of them tell me what's going on in their lives. Some of them, and a lot of them are kind of steering the wrong way. And I tell them, I'm like, you know, it's not even worth it. I give them my advice, my tips. They actually take it. And a lot of times, too, they use, because I even still get letters from parents uh, to this day. Or when I see the parents, they're like, oh, my God, you used to teach my kid back in the day when they were in, you know, in high school and grammar school. And you used to tell them, this makes perfect. And then you used to put them in a circle to dance, you know, 
by themselves, they became confident, they became leaders, they, be, they, they became winners. They know that everywhere they go, if I want to be good at this, I got to practice, I got I to gotta be better than this, you know. So I, I, breaking does a lot besides getting you physically fit. It does so much more for these kids. And I, like I said, I still get compliments from parents to this day. You know, the interesting thing is there's, there's a book out right now by um, Gringo Echeverria, Jose, and I forget the title of the book. I actually went out and I bought the book and it, it covers now you know, you're a bit younger than i am but back in the day imported taste and culitos and all-star dancers you know they they ran around and they, they did battles and they went through enemy enemy territory so to speak and a lot of times it was hands off because everybody knew that they were dancers and so as you read his book you hear about some of these stories where there could have been trouble but because they were recognized for a battle that they were in or a festival that they had done or maybe they were at Humboldt Park, you know, performing or um, they talked about practicing at the square under the monument, you know, they were left alone. So this is an escape. And for some reason, a lot of the professionals don't see it that way. It's sad and true because I've, I've been to we, where, where my crew grew up uh, breaking. We always break. It's called a lot. It was outside in the laundromat, uh, the parking lot by the alley and there was gang wars and they would they would literally shoot at each other and not they were like don't mess with the break dancers you know and then they respect it you know just like like just like skaters too people see them they're like ah they're just skaters you know they respect them but also like i i went to a party that i was breaking at this party and it got raided and the cop was like oh my god my son they're so in love with you and she was just like treating me so good she was like you're amazing you, you know this that i saw you i saw footage of you and i'm like wow <laughs> so she was really nice to me but i was like you know i was like wow i touched her and she doesn't even know me but because of her kids you know she knows who i am and she knows that i'm a great influence and she knows i'm a great person you know uh, is that so to speak your foot in the door is that the, the skills that you bring and the stories that you can tell when it comes to young people is it it's like you've got credibility it is, it is, and and the more you, the longer you're around, the more you do it, you know, the more you can add to that resume. You can say, I did this, I was here, I know this person, and, and people love it, because people even, yeah, I can go anywhere right now and start breaking, and people will be like, wow. <laughs> now, it, now it, it's a miracle in itself that you are able to, to still to let, for lack of a better term, as Young NC said, um, bust a move because as I've read your story, and, it's, and you know what, and it's almost perfect that we're interviewing now a couple of years after we first talked about it because you've gone through some things and now your personal life has gone to a whole nother level in terms of impacting people. Um, you're not as much a break dancer as you used to be, but now you've become more of an influence, more of a positive messenger because of what you've gone through. Um, you got hurt. Um, in 2007, a virus attacked my spinal cord, so I was paralyzed from the rib cage down, and they told me I was never gonna walk again. And I told my doctor, after he told me that, I was like, do you know who I am? And he looks at his chart, and so he's like, uh, Ms. Munez? I was like, I'm Lady Chef, and I won't be walking. And I, I walked, I'm walking. I walk, I'm walking, I'm dancing. You know, you you gotta believe. You gotta know. And, and how how old were you when when this happened? This happened when I was thirty one. So you're you, so and you were still active as a as a break dancer. Oh my god, I was so active. I think that was the most active I've ever been. That's hilarious because you remember at Columbia College when um when Anna had to you know dance I, I don't know if it was planned or if it wasn't but they egged her on and then she actually took part in the performance and everybody just kind of went off because they knew that this was somebody who was there from the beginning yeah and a lot of times you can sit back on your throne because you're the queen and you can kind of do what you want but it, it'd be equivalent to Shabadoo coming back and, and, and dancing at the age of 58 mm -hmm. and it feels good and you know what's funny that you just said I could do what I want that's my that's that's my thing. I say that all the time. I'm Lady Champ. I do what I want. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's it's amazing. Like I can go somewhere and I could or could not dance, and people still respect because they know where I've been. They know who I am. You know, like they respect, and I I, I love and appreciate that. You know. Tell tell me about this injury, cause cause you were you were in a wheelchair. Yes. So uh, I would imagine that that there were some you know, perhaps doctors and maybe personal friends or maybe families that maybe thought you'd never stand upright again. Just get on down.
How do you explain how you develop that mindset um, where we come from, where we grow up? Um, there are so many negative forces. There are so many people that are saying you can't do this and you can't do that. And, and why bother? I, I know I had conversations at the Boys and Girls Club with young people, girls that would say, well, you know, by the time I'm 16, I'm going to be pregnant anyway, so I may as well, whatever. Um, there were boys right before, you know, I, I finished my time at, as director of the club. You know, we had the uh, Gangland series come out and do some shooting um, with a video camera. <laughs> and, I was like, wait. <laughs> and they they did some scouting around in, in that neighborhood, and, and they took some film of some of our club members who were not at the club at the time, and they were doing some knuckleheaded things. And I actually had tipped them off to some of our former members who were reformed, but back in the day, you know, were, were gang members. And too often... There are people, boys, girls, teenagers, young moms that are resigned to what they think their fate is because they don't see any other way. And, and it's crazy when you think about it. But boy, I ran into so many kids, so many young people that actually only saw, you know, I'm, I'm going to go from A to B and that's it. Well, I, I had parents who are really strong, like they were like, you know, they're like, when I couldn't walk, I was like, you don't listen to the doctor. You listen to your God. Your God should know. You know, you know and you, your God knows. I have um, great family, great friends. Um, I'm the oldest of my brothers. So right there alone, you, you become strong because you have to look out for the little brothers, you know. Um, I was a tomboy when I was little, so I was fearless. I was, you know, I grew up fearless. I grew up with, you know, my guy cousins, my crew, a bunch of guys. I was always, like, strong. I never gave up, and I was always a champion at heart. I, like, whatever I wanted to try, I would, I would go all out. So, you know, learning how to walk and all that was, <laughs> it was a challenge, but... You know, it's funny. Now, literally, you had to learn how to walk all over again, correct? 
Because mm -hmm. it, it was a spinal injury and it, it, it kept you off your feet for, for how long? One month. Um, I was off my feet for My legs were so skinny. They were like, uh, like my, like my arm. You know how my skinny, my arm would be, my legs were that skinny. They were just bone. All the muscle was gone. And what, I mean, what was the original prognosis that the doctors had told you um, your chances were of doing some of the things that... that you... Oh, I, no, I was never supposed to walk again, ever. So they sent me to a rehab center for two months to learn how to live in a wheelchair, which is a great place um, to go just to learn, because they learn how to shop, I learned how to cook, I learned how to transfer from the, you know, wheelchair to the couch from, you know, like, learn a lot, how to get dressed, how to do certain things, which is awesome, but I knew that it wasn't going to stay that way. How did you develop that resolve? Were there was your circle? Were you surrounded by people that were just so positive minded that they would not allow you to not walk again or to accept the fate that the doctors said? Or is this just you know Lady Champ being Lady Champ? I think a little bit of both because some people did like you know they were like oh you're never gonna walk, but some people were like oh my God we prayed for you and I was you know what I felt it like the night the night that they would pray when I woke up I was like I. Would, I something. I don't know, it's weird to say, but I think just knowing that, you know, you have that support, you have that love, you have people there, and then knowing that you're strong in your in your mind, you're strong spiritually, spiritually, you're strong physically, and you're going to try, you're not going to give up. Just all that together, I think, helps. Was was there was there ever a point where, where you decided, you know what, maybe it's not going to happen, and maybe I'll just resign myself to this is the way it's going to be, and I'll just take my next steps from here? No, I, I just, when I went to the rehab center, I was like, okay, I'm going to do the rehab center, I'm going to learn as much as possible, and if I'm still not walking by the time I leave, I'm going to get in the Par Paralympics, I'm going to learn how to play basketball or something in the wheelchair. And, you know, when I went home from there, I, I started to teach myself standing, little baby stuff. I mean, it's a long process. It sounds easy right now, but, you know, how, learn how to stand, learn how to take steps, learn how to, everything was a process. But once I did that, I was like, okay, maybe I could be in the Paralympics, but, you know, like, you know, slow walking or something. But, but I ended up being able to do everything. Toss. But it's good. I still have issues. Like, I can't feel my toes. I can't feel hot and cold. I still got bladder issues. I get pain, stiffness. You know, so I got a lot of issues still, but, I mean, compared to not having anything at all. Well, it is interesting because, you know, I've, I've had issues with my back, nowhere near the issues that you have, but our bodies get to the point where if, if, if I'm at the computer for too long, for instance, to try to straighten up, that's an adventure. Mm -hmm. um, I know. I already get, I already get that. You, you, get, you get phone calls, people asking you whether it's going to rain or not because they know that you know before anybody else knows. I was telling my friend that today. She came over and I was like, girl, it's the mess up because as soon as I saw the weather forecast for the week, I was like, great, nothing but pain. You already know. Um, I, I don't want to go without you talking about what you're going to be doing um, um, very, very soon. You, you're going to Denver in the name of, of Wings for Life. Tell me about that. Yes, I'll be in Denver this weekend. Um, I'm doing a race. Uh, it's one race all over the world at the same time. So whatever time, well, my race in Denver is 4 in the morning. So I don't know what time China is, Australia is. I know Florida is at 6. So we're all racing at the same time. So we start at our starting time and we start to run. And 30 minutes after we run, they send the bus to, pe to pick up all the last people running. And then the last man and the last woman running are the winners for that you know, country.
right back to 1984 with the original breaking movie, Adolfo Shabadu Quinones, Michael Boogaloo Shrimp Chambers, Lucinda Special K Dickey. Yeah, I had a crush on her. Well, who didn't crush on her? She had all the ballerina moves, all the professional dancing moves, and all of a sudden, she's doing the footwork and the popping and the locking that they're talking about in the songs here. How could you not like her? Wow. Ali and Jerry, Ain't No Stopping Us. Before that, we also heard Planet Rock. We heard Shannon's from 1983, Let the Music Play. At the top of the hour was Freestyle 2000 with Don't Stop the Rock, the original version which Tony Boom Boom Badea used to start off his mixes with when we used to work together. And as soon as that song hit the turntables, yes, turntables, not that other stuff, not a flash drive, boom, they were all over the dance floor. Lady Champ is on the Celebrity Hotline, and we were talking about a book, and I just grabbed it, and I want to read it to you. Well, I'm not going to read you the book, but I'm going to tell you what it's entitled. The Real Dance Fever, book one, the beginning, my story, a tribute to the 80s and the people who made a difference in our lives. Of the all-star dancers, the author is Jose Gringo Echevarria. And, it, and it's a good read. If you can find it, pick it up. And if you can't find it, and maybe inbox me on my Facebook and I'll give you some information on it. Or maybe I'll scan it and put it back up because um, sooner or later we have to have Jose Gringo Echevarria on the Celebrity Hotline. But again, the book that we were talking about, The Real Dance Fever, book one, the beginning, my story, a tribute to the 80s and the people who made a difference in our lives. And Lady Champ, making incredible differences in many lives. And she did that when she did her her, 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 her Wings for Life event um, just last weekend. And we weren't able to cover it because we, you know, we had other things that were already scheduled to be on the air. But we've got her on the Celebrity Hotline now. What do you think? Let us know on the Facebook as we go clickety-click. And we will go scroll calling in just a smidge. Denzel Washington for the Boys and Girls Clubs. In my hand, I'm holding a two inch by three inch piece of paper that has changed the lives of millions of young people. It's kept them off drugs, out of gangs, and in school. Now what could be that powerful and still fit in the palm of my hand? A membership card from the Boys and Girls Clubs. Every day another 300 kids will join clubs all across the country. That's 300 kids who will be picking up a membership card instead of a gun or a needle or a knife. You know, too many people feel like they can't make a difference, but I'm telling you this. Put this card in the hands of a child, and you will change that child's life. Do that, and you can change the world. It's up to all of us. Support a program that works. The Boys and Girls Clubs, the positive place for kids. For more information, and to find out how you can support the Boys and Girls Clubs, call 1-800-854-CLUB. That's 1-800-854-CLUB. That's me right here at 1590 AM WCGO Radio online is triple W. 1590wcgo.com and the podcast www.wakeupdancing.com Maybe you could wake up break dancing. Have you ever done that? You just like roll out of bed and all of a sudden you're spinning around on your head and then you're doing the footwork and you're popping and you're locking. Wow. So many of you to scroll call to and I like to do this because during the week some of you jump on the Facebook page and you're really productive and, and you're, you know, you're spreading some really nice words and then on early on a Saturday morning you're also quickly clicking and uh, how could I not mention those of you who have done that? Christina, Juanita, Cindy, Nadine, Teddy, Ray, Stanley, Gloria, Edwin, Mike, Carla, Carlotta, I'm sorry, Cora, Eric, Julio, Mike, Samantha, Anaceli, Oscar, Layla, Brunilda. A lot of you guys are like original B-boys and B-girls, right? Jessica, Susie, <laughs> Bucky, Sarah, um, Emilia, Sandra, Carol, Bucky again. He, he checked in twice, huh? Christina, Anita, Eric, and Adolfo. Um, Eric, of course, and Adolfo. Chevro Quinones, by the way. Um, Brian, Lydia, Callie, Jessica, Martino, and Louis Rivera, who we called Karate Louis, who was a DJ for a lot of those events that we did back in the day when it was, you know, break dancing and doing dances at the Boys and Girls Club. So why not scroll call you guys when you're clicking during the week 
or as we're doing it you know, here on a Saturday morning at 1590 a.m. So far, such a very cool celebrity hotline conversation. And uh, kind of neat that one of my freestyle friends, Niasia, a couple of years ago put a CD together entitled This Is Me. And part of the CD is a remake of 99 and a half. The original from Carolyn Towns was in the Breaking movie starring Shabadoo and Boogaloo Shrimp. We'll listen to that before we return with more Celebrity Conversation with Lady Champ. strong and um, there's a website that it, that people can visit if they want to learn more about it it's wings for life world run dot com um you also do dance classes and, and this is not like fred astaire type stuff right so it's break dancing b-boying you know like real real street you know when, when you think about people like like anna Rockefella garcia and adolfo sabado quinones are these are the types of people that kind of um laid the path for you to follow or did you just fall into break dancing because one day you saw it on TV and or maybe on Soul Train and said that's what I want to do? I saw it when my cousins did it and my cousins are the ones that blew me away. And and now that they're older, you know, and that everything I've done, they're like, Why didn't we teach you? Why didn't we? And I'm like, Yeah, why did they will always say, Yeah, you're just a girl. Get out of here, you're just a girl You know, and I was like, Damn, if they would have taught me then Oh, my God. In the 80s, a little girl, and then, oh, my God. It would have been amazing. You know, it's crazy because it's 2014 now as we tape this conversation, and you can still hear the same types of comment, uh, oh, well, you're just a girl. Oh, man, you're Latina. Yeah, you can't do this and you can't do that. Um, you know, we're supposed to be a little more advanced than that, but, boy, the stereotypes remain sometimes, huh? Yeah, and that's the thing, though. See, you tell, you tell me that I can't, and I'll be like, I'm going to prove you wrong. Just like my cousins told me I'm a girl. I, you know, I can't break dance. Get out of here. My doctor, you're never going to walk again. Look at me now. You know, you got to you gotta take that, and you got to work till you get what you want, and don't let anybody stop you. Is this part of what you do when, when you work with young people at the variety of agencies that you've been to? What do, what do you do with the young people? Oh my God, I, I just, you know, I, of course, teach them how to dance, but I also give them advice if they have any questions. And they believe it or not, they do. Like, I'm like, wow, they're, like, open to me, you know? They're always open, but I give them, you know, advice on everything, everything. 
you know, it was interesting that the Sun Times chose to title the article that you were overcoming the impossible. The impossible was more what the doctors had told you because it really sounds like you said, well, thanks, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I made the impossible possible. And like, when I was at the rehab center, everyone who was there was in a wheelchair. And the doctors told them they were never going to walk. So I would stroll down the hall in my wheelchair, and I would look into every room and had their head down in their chairs or in their bed, like, that's it, my life is over. And I would stroll by, and I'd be like, hello, everyone, good day, how are you? And it got to the point that they would wait for me to stroll by so they could, like, look up at me and smile. And I would see, like, their face, like, shine with, like, like, I don't know, some kind of, like, tearful joy. I don't know, it was weird, but I think I was meant to be there at that time. Now, now, when when you were told that you might not even wiggle a toe again, and you said, I'm going to break dance again, <laughs> what was the what was the prevailing medical opinion? Did they support you and say, yes, you will, or did they just, you know, just kind of let you believe what you were going to believe, knowing, or in their mind, knowing that it wasn't something you were ever going to do again? Well, at first, they were like, Oh, you know, they were like, okay, whatever, you know. But then when they started seeing, because I, I still see my doctor for the, I have to see my doctor for the rest of my life. When they started seeing that I, I started doing this, I started, you know, bending my legs. I started um, having strength. I started standing up, you know. I started taking baby steps. I started walking, and not just walking. This is what they, my doctor would say. I can't believe you're walking. And not only are you walking, but you're walking so good. Of course I'm walking good. I go to the treadmill and I sit there for freaking half an hour and I, you know, I, I work on my feet, heel, toe, heel, toe. You know, I, I, I work at what I wanted. And I still do that. I was there today. I was working on my heel, toe. Because I still got issues, so I still work on it. So, as an adult now, this is something that will never go away in terms of, you know, your rehab, your workout, your therapy? No, I, I think this is as strong as it gets, but... Like, I, I, I won't give up. Like, if there's, you know, if they, I hope that I can feel my toes one day. I hope that, you know, I, every, I can feel my senses and my legs hot and cold. Like, you know, like, I, I, I'm still hoping. But, I mean, I got this far. I mean, compared to not having any feeling and being just ice cold from the rib cage down, this is, for me, this is hope. You know, and not only is this hope for me, this is hope for the next person in the wheelchair that doesn't have hope because the doctor told them that they can't walk again. They're going to be like, man, but she's walking. I can try, at least try, you know? Tell me about the impact that the youth that you work with have had on you. Um, I would imagine it's therapeutic to have an impact on a young person, and it seems to me that while you're having that impact, they're probably also impacting you. Yeah, they are. they always are. But at the same time, I just like, I just like, when when they ask for advice and whatever, and they actually take it, or they tell me that you know their parents are so proud of them, or they became so confident, or you know, they tell me like little things that um, that I'm like, okay, good, good, like I got this person to open up, good, I got this person to stay off the streets and start doing good, I got this person. that makes me happy, you know. Because these per- these kids would have never been in, in my life if they weren't dancing. They probably would have been in worse situations. Uh, I'm sorry for a minute. Your, your voice tailed away, so I didn't catch what you were saying about some of the young people. But I, but I know that a lot of the ones that you've worked with are come from a similar background to you and come from you know areas where choices are to be made, and, and those choices are not always positive choices. And a lot of them do have that, like... Oh well, you know, like you said earlier, I'm gonna, I'm 16. I'm gonna have a baby by that time. A lot of them do have that, but then they meet me, and I'm just like, I'm feisty. Like I'm like, oh yeah, you, you're gonna do this, or you better try this. But they're like, oh, I can do that. I can try that. Like it seems like they're limited. You know, there's so much more instead of thinking one way. You know, so once I start talking to them, they're like, oh, well, why am I just thinking that way? So since you've reminded me of the movie, All the Ladies Say, tell me a little bit about that and, and how you became involved in that and, and you wound up in a circle that included people like, like Anna Garcia, who, who's known as Rockefeller.
for years and um, she had asked me if I wanted to be part of the film she was making a film and I was like of course you know so it, it's a story about seven women um, and how they live their lives but still be a part of hip-hop you know still have still want to break still want to do certain things but you have you know you have your kids you have your job you, you know life happens and then you know what while we were filming we were filming my part the year before this happened, then you, you see me normal with the kids, working, doing this, doing that, and then you see me paralyzed in a wheelchair. And everybody's like, what the... I mean, you see everybody's reaction while it ha it's happening. Then you see me, you know, in my outcome. And then, you you know, everybody has their story. And it's, it's pretty deep. Like, it, it's amazing. And, and it's inspiring to women and even guys, because when they see it, they're like, yo, like, I didn't know, you know, my girl goes through all this and she still wants to do this. It's, it's hard. You know, but a guy could have a kid and he could have a job and still can go to practice. You know, it's it's just weird. And also, some of the kids that you that you've worked with in the past, these are kids that everyone else has kind of given up on. So you so you wind up at at like a Campos High School, where the regular system decided that. You know, it may not happen for you, and, and even, you know, a GED class might decide, well, you know, let, let's go in a different direction, and then you wind up at a, at a school like Campos where they, they welcome everybody, they give them a sense of culture, and then they give them challenges so then they can achieve, and for some reason, not enough people use those strategies, and I never understood that. Even when I was at the club, I didn't understand why the culture wasn't at the forefront of everything up on Division Street. Um, it seems that way when you look at it, but when you looked at some of the strategies used by, by you know, some of the workers, some of the agencies, no, you know, the cult, the culture was, hey, look, there's a flag. But then they weren't teaching the kids anything. Wow. But you know, when 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 you challenge these kids to challenge yourself, that right there is like, and it's great to teach them about their culture. I I I always ask my kids like, I don't care what background they are. I'm like, well, tell me about your background. What do you what do you know? And they're like, oh, not too much. Well, I don't know about my other side. I'm like, you should learn. Like, that's your culture, you know. When you grow up, it's something that you, you want to see, that you want to know, that you want to, just to know, you know, just to feel it, just to know it, just to talk about it. I love it. I I love my, my culture, and, and and I always talk about it, but I always tell kids, you know, learn the dances, learn the language, learn, you know, le learn everything. Well, I, I have to admit, I, I grew up in West Town. Um, when my Puerto Rican family was one of the very, very few in an area that was mostly Italian, and eventually, you know, it would it would flip and it would flip again and it would flip again. But it wasn't until I became director of the club, and I was on Division Street every day, and I was working with the kids from from Von Humboldt School every day, and, that I started saying, you know what, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, and maybe it's time that I that I really became Puerto Rican besides just you know by my name. Um, then the culture really kicks in, then the music kicks in, and the dances kick in, and the food kicks in, because um, a lot of times people just kind of sort of forget where they come from. It's not that they forget, because I, I honestly didn't start like really, really embracing it until I was in my 30s. It's just that when you're young, you want to be onto what's hip and, and cool. So, you know, you think like, oh, my mom listens to salsa, I don't want to listen to salsa, you know, like you're, you're, you know, you think a different way. So once you reach a certain age, you're like, what? That's beautiful. Like, listen to this is music that, that that comes from the island. You know, like this is this is amazing. You know, so you start once you start getting older. And let me tell you, my mom's like, I cannot believe you listen to this all day. And I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> like it's 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 sad that I didn't appreciate it then. But let me tell you, I love it. I break to salsa. You know, it's it's amazing. Um, tell me about some of the issues that, that, that are bugging you 
right now we're taping the conversation like a day after for instance the the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers has been bounced from the NBA for comments that were just really really stupid and it wasn't even I shouldn't even say they were stupid comments it it seemed as if these were the values that he lived by and and there's a lot of things going on like that where, where people are, are stereotyping and prejudice and I know there are things that they that you talk about a lot if somebody looks at your Facebook page it's not let's talk about my career as a break dancer you will post about the latest issues that are facing the community so tell me about some of the things that, that, that you really feel strong about that you want people to know oh my god the biggest thing is 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 the crime in Chicago like the the shooting hello can you hear me yeah I can hear you oh, it's the shooting because every and they're just telling us about the weekend every weekend is 30 something people shot and a few killed they're not telling us about the weekdays yesterday four people got shot that they showed not that they said like I'm sure there was more today I saw breaking news three people got shot you know like this is normal to us I, I, I'm even scared to walk to my car because I'm like Man, I don't think it's that like randomly like you know it's scary you don't you don't know what to expect anymore you know it's interesting that you say that because I was talking to a friend of mine um, last week and I said you know what it looks like it looks like the city is immune to this epidemic kids are killing kids um, no adults are killing adults obviously but you read about it so much and the numbers have become so large that it becomes a matter of fact it's like chewing gum and it shouldn't be that way people should be outraged and people should be doing things like like Mirna Roman does and it's kind of well Chicago and, and that mindset has to change it's terrifying like, I'm telling you it's terrifying and I, I've been talking to people all week like out you know and people are like man I, you know and they say the same thing I have kids and, and you know I can't even let my kid go outside because and not to be, because you know, you, your kid is like, you're, you're, you don't, you just don't want to let me go. No, I want you to enjoy the days like when I was a kid, but like, it's not the same, you know. And then if, if my son goes outside or my daughter, I, I got to be wondering, oh my God, are they okay? Oh my God, this, oh my God. Even me, when I go outside, I'm like, man, am I going to be okay? It's that scary, you know, and it's not like... It's not like you're just getting hurt. They're taking lives. They're taking lives that you can never replace. What's working and what's not working? I, I've been a part of, of some of the parades and some of the marches, and the thing that that gets to me about the parades and the marches is that a lot of people come out because it's the thing to do, but then you don't hear about a next step until the next march, and it usually follows that somebody else got hurt. So to me, that's one of the things that that's not working. But then there are things that are working. There, there's 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 a lot of awareness, and then there is some education. It's just it's a war, and, and, and boy, we're losing. I hate to put people on blast, but politicians are the first ones that are at that march. And after the march is over, as soon as it gets in the paper or as soon as they get on the news and people see their faces, they're gone. You don't hear nothing about them. I think they need to put, you know, all these programs, whatever it is, whether it's sports, dancing, or anything else into these schools, into the park districts. I remember back then, you can go to the park districts and do a lot of things. Now, you know, you have to... Um, you have to, you have to pay, or you have to do certain things, and I'm like, really? Back then, it was like. Well, with some of with some of the parks, the park that's closest to me, I won't name it because I don't I don't want you know people to get put on blast like you say. Um, but the park that's closest to me, and, and I grew up in, 
I will walk by there and feel like I'm not welcome there. It's it's a whole nother mm-hmm. it's a whole nother client. Um it's well let's use Humble Park as an example since I worked in that community. The tennis courts went up and basketball rims go down. And and, and and I said, Well, who did this park used to be for? We used to walk from Erie and Hoyne to Humble Park whenever my father was in a mood that we needed to get away, I'll leave it put that way. And now sometimes there, you, you can go to Humboldt Park and not feel as if it's your park anymore. Nope. Before, and this is what I'm saying, before, I, I would go to the park and I was like, wow, cool, you know, let's just go and do this. And now it's like, uh, don't touch that, don't look at that, don't go in there, don't, and I'm like, oh, okay, like, so how do you, how do you think these kids feel? No, I'm telling you, I'll, I go to get the Sunday paper, and I've been in this community that I live in now since uh, my little brother was born in 68, so since at least 68, and I go to get the I'll take my little walk to, to Grand and National and they get the paper and I'm telling you there are people on a Sunday morning that will look at me as if I don't belong and I'm like, dude, I was here before you were born. <laughs> wow. And it's just bad. I mean, you know, the mayor's always on TV. Yeah, yeah, we gotta do this. Do it then, you know. Stop talking about it. Be about it. You know, the police commissioner always like tr- trying to avoid the question by answering with something that doesn't make any sense just say what it is yeah there's there's a problem here let's solve it instead of instead of that he's like no there's no problem it, we're taking care of it no you're not um, we're talking to Lady Champ. Um, she's Chicago's. Um, should we call? Uh, are, would you be the best known break dancer of the day? Is that, is, is that a, a qualifier for you? I, I would say a pioneer, the B girl pioneer, because I was one of the first B girls that, and, and the first in the '90s that people remember and know of. And, and who are some of the ones that that, that blazed the trail for you? Whose footsteps you said, you know what? These are the ones I want to follow. Well, here I don't know of any B girls from back then I wish I did because I would love to meet them and talk with them um, but other places there was like uh, Rockefella Honey Rockwell Asia One um, there was you know girls out there but wow I mean we would talk about more with those girls that are out there but boy it is just about time to fly on a Saturday morning um, we heard music from um, all the segments have been Lady Champ and what was Mr. Lee Pump of Chicago um, we heard Anna Rockefeller Garcia Somos Boricua in the back of your head right now is Seabank with one more shot and if you look at the clock it is just about time to fly and we still have more voice tracks from Lady Champ Chicago's very own so coming up very very soon I don't want to promise you when because we have other interviews that are that are racked up and ready to go. Maybe I'll do a special podcast extension to this particular radio broadcast of WCGO Celebrity Hotline Conversation. Yes, she's Lady Champ. We're buddies now, but we got to say bye. Take care.